Well, welcome everybody. Um, I am Jeffrey Welk, and I am the kids pastor at Canyon Creek Church uh, up in Everett, Washington. And we have a few other campuses that we'll talk about today, and many more on the horizon. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that experience. But I, I just want to start by praying real quick that uh, God's presence would continue to be with us as we talk through this. So do join me. God, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, just the opportunity we have to be here and be strengthened, be developed, be empowered, and, and to come and just get refueled. And so, God, as we just talk through multi-site today, and this is very uh, prevalent in our network, and it's up and coming, and uh, all of us are going to be on the front lines of this at some time uh, in our kids' ministry career and, and the calling that you've given us. And so, Lord, as we talk through it today, I pray that your presence would continue to be here, Holy Spirit. Spirit, lead and guide this discussion, and uh, God, we love you. We thank you for even what we just heard from Damon. And God, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to do things for you um, when a lot of times we need to step back and realize what you've already done for us, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Well, let me give you a little bit of bio on myself, and i bring you up to speed with um, why I'm standing here today. Um, I was a youth pastor for about seven and a half, eight years. I got sick of teenagers, like extremely sick of teenagers, uh, like unhealthily to the point where it was like I woke up one day and I'm like, I don't ever want to be around them. And so it was like really one of those things where it was like God didn't have to like convince me. It was like he'd already done it. It was like, you probably shouldn't work with them anymore. You should probably look at doing something else. So uh, I stepped out of youth ministry and it was kind of... Wondering what God's next step for me was. Uh, spent some time doing assimilation uh, at the church plant that I was a part of, and and um, which was great, and I loved it, but it wasn't ultimately what I believe that God was calling me to do. Uh, transition forward uh, a few years. This is after my wife and I spent some time church planting. We were on a church planting team down in Vancouver, Washington, a North Creek church down there. And um, still, in fact, next week we're going to go visit and, and that church is doing amazing. It's great to see what God's done there. But uh, fast forward a little bit, we moved back to Seattle area from Vancouver, Washington and kind of in that year of limbo. I was attending Eastlake Community Church with my buddy Brent over there, and he conned me into uh, helping him in kids ministry. He said, you don't even have to come in and spend time with the kids. I just want you to story tell. That's all I want you to do. Just come in, story tell, and you can leave. Yeah, he, he knew. And so like, I went in, I story told for a week, and then I couldn't just leave. I was like, oh, I want to kind of see what this is about. And so story told the next time and found myself jumping in a small group and then story told another time and just ended up hanging out and so for about the next year I was just there at Eastlake helping out helping him with the kids ministry storytelling being involved there and fell in love with kids ministry just absolutely um, just fell in love with it and uh, I would have never thought I don't know if your story is along those same lines, but for me, I would have never thought. Because when I was a youth pastor, it was like, nah, I don't ever want to do kids ministry. And, uh, well, God had different plans. So fast forward um, a little bit beyond that, I get hired at Canyon Creek Church. Um, at that time, was in Linwood, Washington, and I was hired on with the idea of, hey, we want to go multi-venue um, someday. We don't know when that is. Um, oh, and by the way, we're going to hire you. And two weeks from now, we're moving locations too. So get ready to move. Uh, so my first month of work was about 100 hours a week, um, getting our new facility ready. I actually even have a plaque that says uh, first worst month of work ever uh, because I, I felt like I slept at the church. Um, and so now we actually, our, our hub campus is in Everett and uh, right up by Boeing. And that is, uh, that is where our hub is that we moved to two weeks after I was hired uh, to, to come in and, and help with with Canyon Creek. When, when I, we were hired on there, uh, Kids Ministry, to be honest with you, it was just struggling. I first couple weeks just observed and I had a chance to, to do that and just kind of watch what was going on and, and realized real quick that the culture needed to change, and especially if we were going to go multi-venue, multi-site. And um, so we started that process of, of developing new leaders and, and all of that. And so now, as of today, we uh, were uh, the, the kids ministry and the volunteer base, we've tripled in size in the last two years. And uh, God has just blessed us with amazing growth 
growth, amazing leaders, and um, we are, are just continuing to, to push forward. So right now we actually have two active campuses. We had a third, we'll talk about that, uh, that uh, was acquired uh, in a certain way. And then this next year, we're looking to, um, looking to plant uh, another campus January of 2014, another one September of 2014, and we may have a church absorption in the mid-year of 2014. So it'll be three more campuses this next year. Last week, we just planted a campus in Costa Rica. Uh, that is actually an autonomous church, so it doesn't fall under the umbrella of kind of what we're going to talk about. But uh, we have a thing at Canyon Creek called the REACH Initiative, and it's a big, huge incredible vision that our lead pastors put in front of us and we want to plant 100 churches in, in the lifetime of, of Canyon Creek and so we're well on our way to uh, planting those churches as well as um, both nationally and internationally. So I stand here saying I am not the expert on this. We are still even brand new to this process. We have done some stuff right. We've done a lot of stuff wrong and that's how we learn, right? Nothing like a little on the job like live training to be like, what were we thinking? That, how, why did we think that that was going to work? But uh, we have put in, in place some, some great um, principles that, that help us move forward with the process of, of going multi-site. And uh, we'll talk a little bit through that today. We're, our talk, we're going to break down into three different sections today. I want to just talk about multi-site. I don't want to assume everybody just automatically knows what that is. Uh, we're not going to take a ton of time to talk about that, but we'll talk a little bit about multi-site. It's actually been around a lot longer than you think. And um, we'll talk just a little bit about that. And then I want to talk about three must-haves when it comes to multi-site. And then and we'll look at three different models, and then I'm just gonna we're gonna open it up for questions. And uh, I think the the time at the end will probably be the most um, beneficial to all of us here. Uh, I'm sure you'll challenge me with some questions, and if I don't know, I will say I don't know, uh, and, but I will find an answer out for you. And so. Um, You've got a sheet there in front of you. We're going old school today. Fill in the blank. I'm type A. So, um, like, I, if you're just like, okay, stop talking and get to the blanks, like, we're going to get there just, just shortly. So that's me whenever I'm like, okay, so you're talking a long time and this, none of these have the blanks. Can you, can you help me fill some of these in? Um, we will get there. Uh, along the way today, I want to interject our experience as well at Canyon Creek and talk a little bit about that because uh, that is... Um, pretty much all I have to fall back on other than what I've talked to other people uh, about and seen or heard. But uh, first-hand experience is always, always the best. So let, let's talk a little bit about multi-site. I don't, like I said, I don't want to assume that everybody just automatically knows what multi-site is. Uh, multi-site is simply, by definition, is one church meeting in multiple or many locations. And so this is different than autonomous churches. Autonomous church plants, oftentimes what happens is even if they're planted out of another church, they have their own uh, constitution and bylaws eventually. They have their own uh, staff structure. They have their own maybe even vision and purpose statement and core values and all those things. So autonomous church plants are, are different than what we're talking about. Multi-site is under one umbrella. So one church meeting in multiple locations or many locations. And like I said, this has been around a lot longer than we think. Actually, back in the 1800s, there were, the Methodist church had circuit riders. And circuit riders were actually in charge, or they were the pastors of multiple satellites. And literally, they would have a leader or a deacon that would be on site to kind of help run the site until they could literally ride into town. And they would ride into town, they would preach and, and pastor and shepherd, and then they would move on to the next site. So the Methodist Church, this is back in the 1800s, let's fast forward a little bit into the, the 1980s. There was a, a few pastors that started to explore more of what we know traditionally now as multi-site. And so just a, a handful of pastors in the 80s started to, to think about multi-site. We all know the 80s, it was like mega church, right? That was the big thing. And so the, these were kind of like revolutionaries at that time. They're like, wait, you don't want to have 20 to 60,000 people in one venue? You want to actually try to break that up and like try to reach more people? 
Like, yeah, in more, more locations? Yeah, yeah, we actually want to try that. And so they, they, uh, they started to do that. By about 1990, there was about 10 multi-site churches in the U.S. Uh, in the 90s. Uh, moved fast forward to 1998, that had grown then to almost 100 churches uh, in the U.S. And then 2005, you hit 1,500. And then 2008, now you're over 2,000. And it, the number just keeps growing and growing and growing. So what's important about that progression is that this movement of multi-site and multiplication isn't going anywhere. It's not going away, it's going forward. So if we're just like, ah, oh, that's just a fad. Uh, no, this is at the forefront, especially at our network. If you've been to any conference lately within our network, we are talking multiplication. We're talking how can we reach more people for Jesus? How can the gospel move forward more effectively and rapidly. In fact, look at the top of your paper there. This is a, a scripture verse that we just adopted when it comes to our REACH campaign at Canyon Creek. And this has kind of been our mantra. Um, and it's, it's 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. And you'll see this is from the New Living Translation. It says, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, uh, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly. And we'll be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. So we hold on to that and we're like, hey, we don't want to just tell a few people. We want to tell as many people as possible. And we understand that the number one way, and statistics show this, for us to do that is to start new campuses, plant new churches in new communities that need an influence in their community. So if we want to spread the gospel rapidly, we want to try to do that as, as quickly as possible. We understand that that's going to take multi-site. That's going to take not just multi-site, it's also going to take autonomous church planting. And so we've developed the, the thing at Canyon Creek they called REACH, and we wrap all of that into one big huge fund, an umbrella that kind of helps keep that vision in front of our people. In fact, we've even moved to, uh, even in our giving, this is just a side note, in our giving we've moved to tithe and REACH. And so we don't even have departmental giving and things like that. That all just comes through budgets and we do all that on the side. But when people are like, hey, I want to give to, I want to, give to see more people come to know Jesus, you're like, great, give it to Reach. And out of that, we do foreign missions. And out of that, we plant more churches. And out of that, we plant more campuses. And we do local outreach and all of that. Because we want to see the gospel spread rapidly. And I believe that every single one of you wouldn't be sitting here today if you didn't want that for yourself for your church, for your ministry, to see more and more people come to know the, the saving, to come to that saving knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, multiplication movement, it's not going away. And, and like I said, we are poised to be on the front line. There are, you heard it from Pastor Troy last night, as we plant more churches and as we do multi-venues, the kids' ministry has to be Excellent. It has to be that point where a family walks in and they say, yeah, everything else was alright, but my kids loved it. And so we are going to be at the front lines of trying to figure out, as an individual, as teams, how do we make that happen over multiple venues? Because it is challenging. It is not easy. It is challenging. And... Um, but here's the thing, as challenging as it is, the reward is so worth it. When you hear about a new campus that was planted and, and they say, hey, we added 12 new families this past month who didn't know Jesus. We've added them, not just shown up, but they came and then they came back and then they came back a third time. That's when we kind of consider that they're in, right? They came back a third time. And this month alone, we added 12 new families to said campus. And guess what? Their kids had never even heard about the Bible. They've never even unwrapped a Bible. And we got to give them for the first time. We got to give them their very first Bible. And you're seeing that family's life change literally right in front of your eyes. As challenging as it is, so, so worth it. We can create those environments and, and we can provide an experience for people to come to know Jesus. So, so worth it. So, multi-site church, simply one church meeting in multiple locations in order that we could 
spread the gospel rapidly so we can continue to, to branch out and we can continue to win, win more people to Jesus. Now, that's going to look different depending on what model you subscribe to, right? Uh, multi-site is going to look different in how we choose to branch out, how we choose to plant more venues and more campuses. Um, and, and we'll talk about the models here in, in a little bit. But the, the key is, is that uh, I want to talk first about three must-haves. And these are kind of big picture ideas. Uh, we can talk practicals in the Q&A, like well, how do you get curriculum from one site to the next? You know, and it's things like that. I'm not going to talk about that because that's logistics and, and things like that. Those are important. Don't get me wrong. But I want to talk big picture and leave some of that uh, for Q&A at the end. But three must-haves, and this is where we're going to get to your uh, fill-in, so get ready to write. Hopefully everybody's got a pen. And so um, three, three multi-site must-haves. The first thing you need to have is you need to have a compelling and clear vision. A compelling vision and clear vision. I can't stress this enough. I think we understand the importance of clarity and passion when it comes to ministry. Uh, We probably wouldn't do it if we weren't passionate about it because for those of us who do get paid in this room, um, the money, it's not, you're like, wow, I'm just loaded. I mean, I can retire like couple months from now. I mean, no, no, we don't do that, right? But it's it's important, uh, the importance of clarity and passion when it comes to ministry. It's really hard for people to fully jump on board uh, when there's ambiguity in your vision and your uh, and your passion and in regards, you know, a lot of them are like, why well, do I don't want to jump on board? Why, why am I jumping onto this ship? Especially in multi-site. Because as you begin to branch out and you begin to talk to people about it, uh, they're like, well, but, but we like to be together. We will like being, you know, we like having 3,000 people in one spot, even though I only know 20 of them. You know, they're like, we like we like this. And w- your compelling and clear vision, when you start to cast that and you start to begin to talk to your kids' leaders, when you begin to talk to your volunteers and develop a launch team, because just as you have to do that as a lead pastor of a campus, you have to do that as a kids' pastor. You have to have that person that you're like, man, I believe in you. You are amazing and you are going to go and you're going to rock this campus. And just keep that vision in front of them the whole time, saying, hey, because of you, people are going to come to know Jesus. Because you're sacrificing and you're moving to this campus and you're kind of going out on your own, people are going to come to know Jesus. Families' lives are going to be changed, not for a moment, but forever. And so as you keep that in front of them and make it clear, this is how we're going to do that. This is how we're going to help you do that. So we're going to have resource you to do that. And... Uh, even with volunteers, because the way that we've done it is as we continue to launch more campuses, we find key volunteers that we want to put around that leader. And we have to cast that vision to them because a lot of times a new site is mobile. So you're like, oh, you don't just get to show up 15 minutes before service. You're going to show up an hour and 15 minutes before service. You're going to set some stuff up. You're going to tear some stuff down. So if it's not compelling and it's not clear, here's the two things that happen if it's not comp- if it's not clear confusion sets in and people just jump ship and guess what they end up back at the hub campus cuz there's like that wasn't I don't know why we were doing what we were doing even if you're like yeah we're we're you know we want to see people come to know Jesus and they're like yeah that was good for the first 2 weeks until I realized like my kids are falling apart in the kids ministry cuz I'm here so long and all that uh it's really easy for people to want to jump ship at that point if it's not clear and consistent why we're doing what we're doing and if it's not compelling then ex- exhaustion just causes people to quit if it's not compelling then people are like well why why am I doing this? So, we got to keep that compelling and clear vision in front of not just volunteers, but ex- incredibly at the forefront of everything we do when it comes to whoever our campus leads are and things like that, which we'll talk, we can talk structure in a little bit. But, um, you know, if there's people that are currently serving on your kids' team that you are planning to have launch a campus, you need to start meeting and preparing them now. If you're six months out, if you're you know, a year out of wanting to do this, maybe your lead pastor is hinting at this. If there is even a hint 
from your lead pastor about doing multi-site right now and, and multiplying that way, you need to figure out who it is on your kids' team right now that you are choosing and you want to start investing your time and energy into and continuing to mentor them and bring them up because you don't want to put somebody that's inadequate into that role. You don't want to put somebody that's unprepared and you don't want to put somebody out there that's going to turn around and take every issue and problem and all those things that that campus has and bring them all back to you and be like, I can't solve this. I don't know how to do it. You want to make sure that person is prepared and resourced and you want to put a compelling and clear vision in front of them consistently over and over and over again because that will just drive them to continue to do that which God is calling them to do and what we are asking them to do. You know, we have a a very compelling and clear vision at Canyon Creek. You heard me talk about reach. A hundred churches, that's big, right? That is like, when Brandon first said this in staff meeting, I was like, that's a lot of churches. I am one kid's pastor. (laughs) A hundred churches. And so now we're beginning to see how do we make that happen? How do we flesh that out? Uh, But he consistently keeps it in front of us. Hey, uh, make sure you're growing because, you know what? 100 churches. If you're not growing, that means the person that you're mentoring is probably not growing either. You want to continue to raise those people up because we're going to need like 100 little people like you. We need 100 yous running around and doing... um, Oh, that which, which you need to do. I, I mentioned, once again, we just planted that church in Costa Rica. Uh, it was really amazing to see uh, that, that come to fruition. That's something we've been talking about for uh, about a year. And uh, some of our team flew down there and got to do the uh, inaugural service and, and things like that. So that was, that was pretty awesome. Um, but once again, 100 churches, we're looking to... We've, we've got three or four more coming up this here in Washington. We're going to be planting in Arizona. Uh, an- another hub campus in Arizona with five arms that will go out from that. And then we move to Nevada, Northern California, Southern California, and then Hawaii. So, which I think everybody who's on the team that's a roughly my age is thinking, yeah, we could totally pastor in Hawaii about 20 years from now. So uh, that would be good. Uh, I know for sure our lead pastor is thinking, I'm retiring in Hawaii and pastoring there. Retiring. I'm not sure he'll ever retire. But... Um, but anyways, we, we have got this, this mapped out. It's clear and it's compelling because we're looking at communities. We're doing demographical studies. Where, are, where, where do people need to hear about Jesus? Obviously everywhere, but where is there a lack of influence? And so it's consistently clear. It's consistently compelling. And once again, that, that is a big and compelling vision, uh, not because it's a lot of churches, but because uh, those number of churches represent countless people's lives changed. That's why it's big. That's why it's compelling. That's why we do what we do. Right? We could all go maybe work in the business world. We could all go do something totally different uh, and probably make more money. Uh, We probably wouldn't be that fulfilled because we're all called to do what we're doing. But um, it's a big big and compelling um, vision. Number two is this, must have is you got to have open and effective communication. Open and effective communication. Uh, a system for communication is essential when it comes to uh, getting ready to launch out into multiple venues, multiple campuses. Um, uh, there must be the, the culture of both, both that it's open and both that it's effective. Uh, what I mean by open is that it's honest, it's authentic, it's trustworthy, because you are launching uh, people out from your ministry, from your kids' ministry, and um, they, if you want to make sure that they feel like they can do this after you've put the compelling and clear vision in front of them, you have to have open communication with them. Uh, because they may look at you and say, like, yeah, I, don't, I don't think I can do this. Now, we know sometimes we need to push the bird out of the nest a little bit, right? We know that sometimes we see in people what's in them before they see it, right? We're actually already taking people and leaders. We're helping guide them and lead them to a place. The Holy Spirit's already moving them. We're just kind of that extra, like, you know, knee saying, hey, you can't do this. But if the culture of open, authentic, trustworthy communication isn't there, then... um, that can fall apart really quickly. We've learned that from experience. Let me just say that. That we uh, had launched a campus. Uh, we thought we had put the right person in the right place. Um, but 
the whole time, he was feeling insecure. He was feeling just these feelings of inadequacy, not prepared, and I take full responsibility for that. That's me. Not creating a culture where he can come and say, hey, I don't feel ready to do this. The vision is great, it's clear, it's compelling. I need more time. And so it has to be open, com- open communication, both before you launch and after you launch. You've got you to give those people a time to, to vent if they need to vent. Hey, setting up every week sucks. You know, I mean, if, is anybody, who church planted in here? Anybody church plant mobile church? Are you guys mobile church right now? Yeah. So you know that that attitude can seep in, right? I mean, we church planted, and after two years of setting up and tearing down every week, I'll be honest, there was a little bit of that, like, man, if we could just buy a building, it would be awesome. Like, if we could just, can somebody raise some money? It was never me. I was like, can somebody else do this? Can somebody else, instead of being like, hey, I want to make this happen. And so, um, you know, there, there needs to be open communication both before and after. And you need to create avenues and, and um, opportunities for your multi-site leaders to be able to say, hey, this stinks. Um, we, the way that we've done that, uh, or as far as effective, there needs to be a systematic approach. So it's open and it's effective. A systematic approach with accountability, uh, both to the hub campus and to their campus pastor. And so um, the way that we kind of do that is uh, we do a weekly report. So a weekly report looks like this, is that uh, a Sunday happens, which uh, we heard Troy talk about, like, hey, make Sunday happen. So all of our campus uh, leads and directors and things like that, they make a Sunday happen, and then we have a weekly report that they fill out and turn in. It allows a couple things. It allows us to ensure that, uh, that they're getting proper support from the hub campus. They're being resourced. They feel like they've got everything they need to make a Sunday happen. It allows them uh, to help, allows us at Hub to be able to address any concerns with them if they need our assistance. It allows them an opportunity to vent. It does. allows them an opportunity to, to um, you know, talk about things that they may not um, be able to talk about with anybody else. Uh, the other thing it does is it enables all of us together as a one church, many locations to celebrate wins, which is so important because, once again, that clear and compelling vision, that just fuels it. If, you know, campus over here says, hey, this is a win, and we send that out in an email and say, hey, this, this campus, big win this last week. Everybody else is like, that is so awesome, and we want to do that, and we want to make that happen. And so um, open and effective communication also encourages collaboration. It allows us to come together and put all of our minds together and resources and make this thing the, the best that it can possibly be. And when the mission is compelling and clear, uh, you know, then collaboration is actually an amazing and essential piece of uh, making multi-site happen. The third thing is this, is you've got to have a proactive leadership pipeline proactive leadership pipeline. Uh, this is not just another must-have as you start thinking about multi-site. So now we've got a clear and compelling vision. Our, we've created a culture where our communication is both open and effective, and now we want to make sure that we have a proactive pipeline. We could actually maybe even see say as well, we want our pipeline to be deep. We want it to be lots and lots of people that we are raising up through um, that system. Um, you not only need to have a leadership pipeline, if you don't have a leadership pipeline, start there. Like, you should probably be seeking some individuals that you're trying to reproduce yourself in them. That would be um, wise, because there's going to come a time where you um, may transition, God may call you to something new, and you don't want everything, uh, the system and all the things that you, you've created, that God has called you to create and, and make this system and process and all of those things in this this machine that works week in and week out just fall apart because you're not there. Right? That's not healthy. That's not healthy for the church. That's not healthy for us. And so you want to reproduce yourself and be raising people up. Um, and so if you don't have a leadership pipeline, definitely get one and then make sure it's proactive. Uh, make sure you're doing something. Uh, proactive by, by basically leading your leaders where the Holy Spirit is already pushing them. Um, how many of you guys can think of two to three people in your ministry right now that you want to take to a, a certain level of leadership? Two to three leaders. Perfect. So 
proactive. We're already thinking, these are the people that I want to see step up into a new level of leadership. I want to help mentor and guide them to, to this place. And a lot of times, God gives us insight into those people's lives, right? There's people that I've met the first time they volunteer in kids' ministry. And I'm like, oh gosh, i got plans for you. Like, I know exactly. One of them is here this weekend. He stepped into our kids' ministry one time uh, as a first-time serve, and I literally watched him and observed him. Our first-time serves, all they do is they're there to observe and connect with kids. And so they, they jump in. They can be involved as much or as little as they want that first day. But one thing it does for me is it allows me to also observe them in the environment. And so I'm just kind of watching, and kids are just <laughs> flocking to him. Just like, I mean, everywhere, you know, they're playing basketball on the, this little basketball court thing in our, in our kids' ministry at the Everett campus. And so, I mean, he's just got like literally 20 kids around him. And I'm thinking, this is the first time in here. I mean, this is crazy. Uh, fast forward now, uh, about a year, he has um, helped launch our Mill Creek campus. Now he's back at the Everest campus. He's interning under with me and uh, with the idea that probably someday my wife and I will will plant a campus and that uh, I'm taking him with me. Uh, so he's kind of going to be my, my kids guy uh, there. And so we don't know if we're going to plant a, just a, a campus or a hub campus in another state or things like that, but uh, we're, we want to just raise him up to the point where he can do either just a, uh, a hub campus role, which is overseeing that campus and five others, um, and then, or he can just play a, a campus role on a week to week. But uh, he's amazing. But we, we're proactive about that. So right now, uh, we, being proactive, we have a process for apprenticeship. So we have a process that we walk our, our people through. Our proactive pipeline looks like this. And if you want to write this down, it's great. If not, you don't have to. But the way that we do it is this. And we're proactive in, in this way. We, uh, we have a volunteer volunteer for three months. So their first time serve is the, that, that starts the clock. And if they're consistent through three months, then we start to ask them and we start to ask if they would like to host a service. So we move them into just a host role, which means they're not delivering a message, they're not doing, they're literally emceeing and hosting a service. If they're in early, excuse me, early childhood, we ask them to become a service champion. So they don't actually host a service, but they become a service champion, which means they help the early childhood director, if you want to call him that, uh, oversee a Sunday with all those environments. So they're shadowing that whole time. So it looks differently in in uh, early childhood as it does to elementary. Uh, in elementary, then we ask them to champion a service for three months. So they host for two, excuse me, for um, they, they host four services. So they've served for three months as a volunteer. Now they've hosted four services in a one to two month volunteer span. Then we ask them to champion a service for three months, which looks differently than hosting. Now you are the point of contact. You walk in, the volunteers find you. You champion that whole service. That means you're solving problems and issues. You're also the one who's delivering any of the messages that would be delivered. You're navigating uh, the hosts through uh, the, the day, making sure that everything works great. Um, and then we um, have them do an administrative apprenticeship for three months. So we do an administrative apprenticeship for three months. So they volunteer for three months. In that first three months, we ask them, if we realize they could, their host quality, we ask them to host. So it's not like we're talking another two months after that. Um, so it's three months volunteer with a host in there, three months champion, three months for uh, administrative apprenticeship. So that's nine months that they're with us, very, very close to myself or uh, one of our other campus leads, learning the whole process of how we do what we do. Then we consider them as a campus lead. So then we'll say, hey, we're going to be launching a campus. We're launching a campus in Lake Stevens in just a few months. Boom. Uh, you came to mind because you've done an amazing job. And so that's how we are proactive. We have a plan. We have a design for how we want to move people through to where we feel really good about them um, launching out. But um, once again, continually have those two to three leaders that you want to take through a process like that if you're planning on going multi-site because uh, you can't do it all by yourself. You can't be at five campuses. You, can't, you just can't. Cloning. It's not going to happen. 
So they did it with sheep, but they're not going to do it with humans, or, you know, whatever. They shouldn't do it with humans. So, um, but anyways, um, all that to say that, uh, like I said, at, at Candy Creek, I've got three working with me right now, and all three of them are here this weekend, because we also value them being here. So we just pay for them to come. We just pay for all their expenses to come here, because we understand this is going to be instrumental in getting them locked in, continuing uh, that process, and things like that. In fact, they're all, none of them, I told them they couldn't, they, you know, none of them could come here because they already knew the stuff. So I said, you have to go gather information for me while I'm in here. So that's what they're all out doing. But um, we have to have a compelling and clear vision, open and effective communication, and a proactive pipeline. Those are three must-haves if you are planning on launching multi-site. There's a ton of other things that you can have and that would be recommended, but those are like the three that I boiled it down to um, that, um, that will help you launch out on the right foot. Um, real quick, I want to just run through the three models, um, and then, um, what time are we done in here? Oh, two minutes, great. All right, so here we go. <laughs> two minutes. I'm going to go longer than two minutes, because I want to leave time for questions. Here's the three models, and I'm going to go really quick. Independent, which is like the Disney World model. So when you're going multi-site, um, you might have multiple sites still under one umbrella, still the same church, but they provide separate experiences. So you give it, did, anybody been to Disney World? All right. So when you go to Disney World, there's four parks under that umbrella. All four have a separate experience, but they're still Disney. And they're still Disney World. So in the church world, it could be Canyon Creek Church, but maybe each site does it differently. It's a unique experience. Move forward to the, the next one, uh, and the next one is called centralized. It's a centralized model, which... I want you to think of McDonald's in the U.S. You go anywhere in the United States, McDonald's, it's the same. You have the Big Mac, Quarter Pounder, McRib's back, all that stuff is right there, right? And you walk in, for the most part, the environment looks the same. You know, they've been updating, and so maybe some are a little bit behind, but they're updating those things, and, and the environment feels the same. S same things are on the menu. We kind of call that the licensee model as well the licensee model. And what that, what that basically means is that every site is exactly like the original. Just like you would go to McDonald's anywhere in the nation, it's exactly like the original, right? Well, kind of. The original for today. Um, but uh, fast forward now, McDonald's is now international, right? So let's move to that third model, which is a decentralized model. A decentralized model, we can think of international McDonald's. You go to International McDonald's, I went to McDonald's in Costa Rica, and they had some of the basics on the menu, but then they also had tacos and enchiladas. And so there was some different items. It was still under the McDonald's umbrella, it still had the basic structure and all that, but there was a few things that were unique. If you go to Hong Kong McDonald's, they have a lot of those same things, but then they have rice. They have different things on the menu. Now, um, in the decentralized model, there's, there's actually, a, there's a, excuse me, in the centralized model, everything is adopted from the original campus. That means structure, so when you like hire staff and how you do that whole structure, what curriculum you use, all of that is copied exactly across. And a lot of campuses will actually create the exact same environments. So like if I go to this campus in the kids' ministry, grades one through four, it looks this way, and when I go to that campus, it looks exactly the same. Same posters, same paint, same everything, right? Um, so that's a centralized model. It's literally exactly like the original, decentralized. There's actually a transfer of authority that happens as well um, when it comes to decision-making uh, kind of away from the hub campus. Let me tell you how we do it. We, we're a, collabor a collaborative model. We've taken centralized and decentralized, and we've mashed them together. So for big Picture ideas. We're talking vision, purpose, core values. Uh, when it comes down to kids' ministry, system, process, curriculum, things like that. Those decisions all come from the hub campus. So those all actually come from me, and so and the team that we have there. And so we determine the big global things, and then we say at your campus, make those things happen, because we know. Our Everett campus, we've got a climbing wall, a basketball, uh, we have a bounce house in there, we've got stage with lights and TVs built into the wall and like all that stuff, right? 
you can't do that in mobile church. I mean, you can. You just need to start setting up Saturday at like 1 a.m. <laughs> and then you'll be like tearing down. You know, so, so it's not impossible. But a lot of times when we plant another site, it's mobile. And so with that being the case, um, we've, we've done a, a collaborative model where we've joined the two both in structure and authority. So actually all of our kids' leads at a campus, they don't actually answer to me. They answer to me when it comes to big picture global stuff, right? So if they're out of alignment when it comes to um, values, curriculum, things like that, we help bring them back into alignment. Um, but they actually answer to their campus pastor. So their campus pastor hires them with my reference. The campus pastor, they report to their campus pastor. If there's anything their campus pastor wants to talk to me about, they're more than welcome to. But once again, they don't answer directly to me. The reason we've done that is because whenever you launch another site, if you are the lead, you want to pick your team. You want to make sure that you work well with those people. We don't want to just be like, Amanda, all right, Amanda, you're going to go over here with so-and-so. And Amanda's like, I can't stand that person. Like, you know, we're all Christians, but we're all human too, right? So, like, we're like, I can't stand that person. Like, they, they kind of smell or, you know, things like that. Like, we just wouldn't get along. We want campus pastors with our blessing or our reference to, so we say, here's our, it's like a lineup. Here's our five qualified people. Who would you like to choose from? You know, number one, step forward, you know. Like, this is so-and-so. They're, you know. Um, so we use a, a collaborative model. So what it does for me is my role becomes more of a coaching role and an influence role, which is a lot of fun for me. So what we're getting ready to start, we haven't done this yet, but every Wednesday, all of the campus leads will come and meet with me um, from 9.30 to 10.30, and it will just be vision, compelling, clear vision, open, effective communication, and asking them who's in your pipeline. And so it's just a matter of, we're just going to continue to put that in front of them, keep fueling them that way, and then, um, and then they'll do some administrative stuff as well. A few tips on the back there um, that, I, that I left for you guys, just to think about if you're thinking about it. Uh, have that leadership pipeline. Make everything reproducible. To be honest with you, that is so key. Um, if you plan to do an independent site, that's one thing. But um, we noticed that we made just everything reproducible. We made all of our curriculum reproducible, so it's easy to distribute. We wrote, resource everything out of our hub, so we run all the same curriculum at every campus. I, we had the third campus. Quick story on that. It was a church absorption. It was an unhealthy church that we thought we could turn. Um, we couldn't. Um, it was uh, everything you can do wrong when you absorb a church and you take over. Take Take over such a hard word. But when you absorb a church um, that can be done wrong, we did it. So we found that out a little bit later. So we should have consulted other people before we did it. Always wise. Um, so uh, now we're getting ready to potentially be doing that in the middle of this next year. A church that wants to come under the umbrella, we're much wiser. So we, we know how to navigate that better. And so, um, but uh, make everything reproducible. As many things as you can make reproducible, do that. Um, we understand that you can't make every environment reproducible, but be committed to unity. Make sure your team is unified. That If you have somebody on your team that's, that you know is like chirping in the background, pull them aside, have that conversation with them, make sure that open and effective communication is there. And if they just can't seem to get it, you make the hard decision and you say, um, sorry, we, we, we need to look for another option. And so um, prepare for stress. <laughs> Please, prepare for stress. Uh, think big picture. Prepare for site hoppers. If you, have, if you have sites that are close, know that people are going to check them out. They're going to be like, so I wonder what's going on at the uh, campus A, you know, and they'll go over there. And so once again, for kids ministry, that's why we wanted to make as much reproducible as possible. We wanted their kids to have the same experience, the well, same curriculum, worship, all of that, and give the freedom to create the environment. So there's some elements that are still there during free time. Their kids are having fun and, and all of that. But uh, we want to make sure that, that if they go to this site, or they go to this site, or they go to this site, that everything feels the same. The culture is the same. You've heard that word so many times this weekend. The culture is the same. It may not look exactly the same, but when they walk in, the feel is the same. They feel warm, welcome, safe, loved, and they have no problem dropping their kids off. So, quick questions. 
because I'm taking your lunch time. Sorry. So everything's a hub with five. That's the goal. Everything's a hub with five is our goal. So uh, Everett is our hub right now, and we uh, we have a Mill Creek campus. Um, we're launching a Lake Stevens campus. Uh, we have a Saturday night venue that is starting that will eventually become a campus. So it's actually meeting at our Everett campus, but attracting a totally different crowd with the idea of in a year it will launch out into South Everett Linwood and then Mount Vernon, which is where we had our third campus that didn't work out. We've got another church up there that is, is exploring. We've, so that's the, the idea. So Lake Stevens, yeah. So maybe Bellingham. Bellingham scares me because it's like farming and college. And I'm like, farm, farm people have kids, but they're usually work them. They're like, that's why they had so many kids is they're working. And then college people, a lot of them don't have kids. And so I'm like, we got to do a lot of research before we do that. So, so yes, but that's a goal. My information is there. You can email me anytime if you want to get together. We, uh, there's a lot of logistics, and so I'm sure you'll have logistical questions. Um, if you just want to know how we did it, just, just let us know. But what I wanted to do today was just give you some big picture stuff to think about, hopefully challenge you in the area of if you are looking to do multi-site, there are some definite things before you start to venture out into that that you need to have in place. and, and uh, that vision, communication, and then that pipeline. So you want to make sure you're putting the right, right people in the right places. So um, let me pray for you real quick. And then uh, we have, uh, we'll be back here at, I'm going to look at my schedule real quick. It's on the back here. We're back here at 145 is when the next lab starts. 145. Let's pray. God, thank you for all these individuals the call, their desire to serve you, their desire to see as many people as possible come to know you. God, I know that's our, that's our dream. It's what we live for. God, help us to be purposeful and proactive about how we go about that. Help us to put into place the things that, that we need to put into place, not just simply to do stuff, but to position ourselves and poise ourselves on the front lines of multi-site. Because God, in our network, it's, it's, it's prevalent. There's a lot, of, a lot of push for lead pastors to explore multi-site, which means there's going to be a lot of push for us to do that and to structure it well and to raise up the right leaders and to launch these campuses right. Not so that we can look back and say, wow, we did it right but so that we can see the life change. We can hear about the families that are being added. We can see all those people that are coming to know you. We love you, and we're humbled and honored to do what we get to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being here, guys.